Greetings! What I've got for you today is a Luceco 5 foot LED strip light, meant to replace a conventional fluorescent tube. Some of you may remember I took apart a Luxlight 6 footer a few years back. Let's see how this one differs. I'd not heard of Luceco before, I thought at first it might be another rebranding of EcoEarth, who rebranded as Lucemi LED a little while after I reviewed their shock risk LED lamps. Fortunately, Luceco are nothing to do with those cowboys, and in fact have quite a few brands in their portfolio that you may have heard of. Unlike the Lux Light previously reviewed, this one expects the live and neutral to be connected at one end. The other end has a pair of shorted pins, or in this case broken shorted pins, which is probably why it was thrown out, and a warning to not connect power at this end. I've got it plugged into a T8 lamp holder, and with power applied it seems to work okay. It does have cracks in it, that to be honest is probably from where I've dropped it. It's rated at 32 watts, and if you look at the meter, it's pretty much bang on the money. I don't have a 5 foot fluorescent to compare it with, but I do still have the 6 foot Lux light fitted in the kitchen. I also have a 6 foot fluorescent fitting in the shed. As you can see it's got a diffuser which is actually a plastic wrap surrounding a clear plastic tube. And as you can see I've already made a start of peeling it off. And with it powered off you can see what's inside. And it's literally a single strip of LEDs running the entire length. And at the non-powered end, you can see there's some driver circuitry. Now, is there driver circuitry in the other end? Well, let's peel this apart and find out. And near the end, I think this might actually be glass. Even though it sounds like plastic, it might actually be a glass tube. It's certainly shattered like glass. Yes, there's glass, and there's some more circuitry in the end. Well, that was messier than expected. I managed to cut off the double-sided tape to get some of the, the glass off, so at least most of the strip is fine. It's just the, the ends now to take a look at. This is the power end. Let's see if we can get this open. Well, here's the driver, or in fact, part of the driver circuit, because this is the unpowered end of the unit. And what I thought was a short circuit, there is actually a resistor here, and that is brown, black, gold, gold. The other end I've exposed this much. The circuit is still tight in there, but that does mean it might, might still be able to power up. Let's find out. Blow the power up, it'll go bang. Still works. There are 290 LEDs altogether, running as two strings of 145. My transistor tester reports these as having a forward voltage of 2.69 volts. So that's 390 volts across that tiny gap at the midpoint, which is interesting. In fact, putting a meter across them, Shows they run at 436 volts. You know, it could have been designed with that as the midpoint and half the LEDs rotated at 180 degrees. So you don't have like 400 volts across that tiny little gap. But, uh, well, it is what it is. Here's a close up of the two driver boards. And thinking about it, it makes sense to split the boards into two. As it means you haven't got one big board giving you a dark end on the tube. You can tuck away a board in at each end and sort of balance it out. The powered end just appears to be a filter and a rectifier, with the unpowered end carrying the smoother cap and the LED driver circuit itself. Here's a close-up of the same boards with all the components stripped off. And there's an extra copy of the photos at the bottom, which is flipped over so you can see how the top and the bottom of the boards line up. And where would we be without the obligatory schematic for people to complain they can't read? As usual, there's a link to the schematic in the video description. The incoming mains voltage, once rectified and smoothed, is only going to max out at about 350 volts DC. So the circuit is clearly boosting that to an even higher voltage to drive the LEDs, which explains the 500 volt capacitor across the output. The chip that's controlling it all is marked V9YL6LJ4A. Unfortunately, I can't find any data on that chip. I've searched SMD component marking databases. I've looked at the pinouts for all of the ICs shown up on screen now, and none of them match with what's on the board. 
Now there are chips which are used in similar circuit designs and they go under various names. There are flyback controllers, buck boost controllers, PFC controllers, LED controllers, you name it. The closest I can find pinout wise is the DIO 8650D, which is similar but with pins 3 and 4 transposed. So it's obviously not that. Also the compensation pin uses a different circuit to that one. It's more like the circuit you see on the MP44018 or the NCL2801. So how does it work? Not a clue. But let's have a go. The first board is easy enough. There's surge protection, there's filtering, there's rectification and there's a little bit of smoothing. Over on the second board though, well there's all sorts. Tracing back from the VCC pin on the chip, there's a supply which comes from R2 and R3, straight from the rectified mains. Once the chip's up and running though, there's an auxiliary winding on the main boost inductor and it can get a power feed from there instead of wasting power through those resistors. Whichever way it gets power, there's a 20 volt Zener diode keeping the voltage down. That auxiliary winding is also used to feed a zero crossing sense input on the chip so it can monitor what the inductor's doing. The comp input is some sort of compensation thing. Some chips have it labelled as comp, some have it as V control. How it actually works will obviously depend on the chip. The ones with the two caps on the resistor connected to it refer to it as an error amplifier output. Well, there are probably enough errors in this video as it is without amplifying them further. So let's move on. There's a gate output driving an external MOSFET. A lot of these converter ICs have the MOSFET built in, this one doesn't. The MOSFET pulls power through the boost inductor and then lets go, the result kicking through D1 and providing a capacitor smooth supply to the LEDs. Apart from that, you've got some resistors between the MOSFET source and the ground so that the chip can determine how much current is being switched through the inductor, and that's about it. But to me, it's interesting to see how the inductor is used to charge the capacitor. I suppose it makes sense if you consider why a back EMF diode is used on a relay. In this case, you've still got that connection, it's just it's going to find its way through a couple of hundred LEDs and back up through the bridge rectifier to get there. I think. Anyway, it's food for thought, I suppose. Pity about the high voltage across that tiny gap in the LED strip, but it seems to work despite that. It's a pity the end pins got bashed in, really, but then of course it wouldn't have wound up getting stripped down on here, so there you go. Thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you soon.